Welcome to the last of our videos on axially loaded members. This is from chapter five, section four, precast concrete columns. The learning objectives are to understand some of the standard ways of configuring precast concrete columns in architectural situations, and to understand the tables for sizing standard precast concrete columns. We're going to talk about this topic primarily in a conceptual mode. Uh, we will have some tables which are quantitative in nature, but mainly we're trying to understand what the issues are that are associated with those tables. In the case of steel columns, we can often deliver loads to the absolute center of the column. That may happen at the top of a building where we have beams going over the top of the column or it can even happen at intermediate floors where girders are attached to the web of wide flange columns. In that case, the ends of the girder beams are delivering their loads to the absolute center or centroid of the steel column. In the case of concrete, things are inherently different. Concrete doesn't come with thin webs and wide flange shapes. It tends to come in rectangular or round cross sections, which are very dense. And the loads from beams get delivered eccentrically off the center line. So for example, here we have a column of dimension D. We would love to deliver the axial load <coughs> right to the center line of this column, but we don't know exactly how to do that. So what we do instead is we attach something called a haunch, and then we deliver this girder to the center line of that haunch. So in the thought process about this column, we have some loads from up above, which are compressing the column axially. And then we have this offset load P2, which is whatever load is being delivered by this concrete inverted T girder. Uh, this force is not delivered axially. As a consequence, there's a very large moment <coughs> which is being delivered to this vertical element, and that moment is tending to cause rotation in this direction. In other words, we're tending to have the column move in that direction, there in this direction down below. As a consequence, it, it's almost inappropriate to think of this as a column. We think need to think of it as much as a bending member as a column. And so all of our tables have to account for both the axial impact of the force P1 and the below here, the axial impact of P2 in combination with a moment which is tending to produce this rotation. So in the textbook, we have a series of uh, design guideline pages. Uh, they might talk by, begin by talking about the general shape of the column, the pattern of the rebar in the column, and provide a bunch of other design information, um, including definitions of quantities like the design axial strength, the design flexural strength, and so forth. And some of these concepts are going to become much more clear later on, but basically we have to account in some way for that axial force and the moment that's induced. And so we'll have a diagram that looks something like this. This is for an 18 inch by 18 inch column with this pattern of reinforcing, and it's for 5,000 PSI concrete and I'm going to blow this up so we can see it a little bit better. But you'll notice on this axis, we're plotting the moment capacity of the column, which has to do with that offset force. And then we're plotting the axial force on this axis. And you'll notice something that what this says is that as we increase the axial force, we actually are able to also increase the moment associated with this eccentric force. That's a very curious situation, and it comes from the following. 
If we have just this force, we will be inducing tension in the steel on this side. And that tension in that steel will be at some point the limiting quantity or the limiting factor for this column. What those tables are saying is that if we add more force above, we actually can tolerate more of this moment because this axial force is taking some of that tensile force off the steel. So when we come here, we say the moment can actually go up when we add axial force from above because we're stress relieving the tensile uh, effect in that steel on the outer side of the column. So you get a curve that says at some point you reach some peak moment. Beyond that though, when you add more and more axial force, the problem becomes crushing of the concrete on this side. So in other words, the combination of this force causing excess stress in the concrete on this side plus another surcharge of stress associated from the, from the force up above. When we start adding that all together, uh, the larger this force becomes, this one has to become smaller. So initially P2 can get larger and larger and larger, but then when P1 becomes, reaches a certain size, the failure mode is crushing of the concrete, and then P2 has to subsequently get smaller and smaller. Now, all of this is tremendously complicated and we have to look at what are the sources of force for P1 and what are the sources of force for P2. And we may be operating, uh, depending upon our overall design, on various parts of these uh, stress curves. But the key point is that you have to stay somehow within the bounds of these curves in order to be safe. And again, this is an 18 by 18 with eight number 10 rebars. And this tells you what the capacity of that column is. Now there's a whole series of tables in the Precast Concrete Institute's uh, design manual. And you basically can look at your situation, see what P1 is, what P2 is, calculate the moment associated with P2, and go into these tables and find a column that works. So it's a pretty much a trial and error thing. Here we have 16 by 16 inch, 18 by 18 inch. And in these tables, you'll notice we go to 20 by 20, 24 by 24, 28 by 28, and 32 by 32. And there are more tables, many, many more tables available in the precast concrete design manual, which is provided by the precast pre-stressed Concrete Institute, which for short we call PCI. Now, the, the point of all this is these end up being really fat columns. The, uh, the entire aesthetic of them and treatment of them is quite different from steel columns, which can, because we can axially, axially load them, end up being fairly slender and delicate. So that ends our discussion of precast concrete columns.